is up, my friends and fellow busy bees. Today I'm coming to you with another episode of Furniture Flipping Tips, and I hope these are ones that might be potentially new to you. I'm always trying to think of different things for beginners as well as people who are more advanced in this work so that I can, you know, bring some new knowledge to you. So I tried to think through some of the more, not necessarily advanced, I guess, but things that aren't the everyday things that you're doing in furniture refinishing. So hopefully you learn a thing or two if you ever have any suggestions for some tips that I can include in upcoming episodes, because I like to do these periodically, please feel free to reach out. And if you are a fan of furniture flipping tips, another place that you can get these is from my Friday Furniture Focus newsletter. It always includes a tip, trick, or hack from a fellow creator out there doing this work. So if you want to sign up for that, you can head to the show notes of this episode or go to maldidherself.ca and make sure you get on my email list and keep an eye on your inbox. So the first tip is for those pieces that you come across, whether it be at the thrift store or maybe it's a marketplace find and you take a look at it and you can just tell that there is a lot of latex paint on it. Usually you can see multiple layers, sometimes looking on the underneath or on the inside of the drawers will give you an idea because you'll see some different colors that the piece isn't currently painted in. And sometimes the paint jobs aren't so great. You'll see a lot of clumping or drips or paintbrush lines. And if you're anything like me, you will look at that and can already anticipate that it's going to be eating through a ton of your sanding pads or it's going to require a ton of elbow grease to scrape it off or require multiple layers of stripper, which will inevitably cost a pretty penny. But I want to make this suggestion to you that if you have a heat gun or if you're open to purchasing a heat gun, they're not super expensive. I think I got mine for like $20. That is a great first plan of attack when you come across a piece that's painted like this. Because yes, you could spend your time scraping or stripping or sanding it off, but if you can get that heat gun and basically you just move it across the finish, make sure you're wearing a respirator because you are heating up paint and that's not great. And sometimes there'll be smoke that comes out that definitely has not the greatest stuff to be inhaling. So make sure you wear that and some heavy duty gloves because, you know, it's a heat gun. But moving the heat gun across the finish, I find if you keep it moving at all times, it will help to avoid like burning any specific spot. But you just want to keep it going and follow that heat gun with a little scraper. And oftentimes I find that you can get huge pieces off of these pieces of furniture with very, very minimal effort. It is truly so satisfying when you can just get it all clumped up and while it's still malleable when it's warm it will just kind of come off in one long strip and then once it cools down it will harden and become brittle again but you get it off of that dresser or desk or whatever you're working on and it will save you hours and hours of work I promise you. Now I say latex paint specifically because I know I've had 100% success when using this method on that kind of paint. It may work on other types of paint as well. I would anticipate not on like a chalk paint, for example, but it doesn't hurt to try on whatever finish it is if you can't quite tell what type of paint it is. I would recommend starting with that heat gun and see if it will help you out first before moving through your list of tools and strategies for attacking it. Furniture flip tip number two is how to sharpen your carbide scraper blade. Now, my carbide scraper is probably my most used item in my workshop, if I'm being honest. I use it on every single furniture flip I do. Basically, I'm always trying to get that old finish off of a piece before I go in. Typically, even if I'm going to be painting it, even unless it's like a perfect finish prior to me going in. But if there's any chipping or bubbling or anything like that, or I can tell it's a thick, glossy finish, 
I want to scrape that back so that I have something much more porous for my paint to adhere to. So I'm always using my carbide scraper. I have one from Purdy Paint Tools. It works beautifully. I think it was about $30. And the nice thing with carbide scrapers is they have two sides to the blade so you can unscrew it and then like rotate it 180 degrees and use the other side as well. And so they last a really long time. And because we're aiming to not have things end up in the landfill, I would recommend once that blade eventually gets dull, which will take a long time. If you're trying to make it last as long as it could, you could probably use it for like years before you had to like, quote unquote, get another one. However, instead of throwing it out and buying a new one, might I recommend you invest in the inexpensive and easy to acquire tools to sharpen that blade. And even if it doesn't need it necessarily, doing this periodically will just help you out because you won't have to be putting so much effort and muscle into scraping the finish back because that blade will do a lot more of the work for you. So you're gonna need two main products in order to do this. You want to get some lapping fluid and I'll be sure to link some in the description of this episode for the items that you will need, but lapping fluid and a steel credit card blade sharpener. And you want one that is the 300 grit, I guess is the word you would use. So basically, you're going to want to take that carbide blade off of the scraper handle. For mine, you just need a screwdriver. You just unscrew the screw that's holding it in, pull that blade off, give it a little cleaning if it has any gunk or old finish or dust or whatever on it and clean it up. And then you're going to get the widest flat side of that carbide blade and you're going to take that... 300 steel blade sharpener and put some lapping fluid on it and then you're going to rub that widest flat side of that carbide blade onto that sharpener and basically just like rub it back and forth or swirl it around or whatever works best and that's going to sharpen it for you but you specifically want that side of the blade because that's the part that's going to be actually like seems very obvious to say but scraping that finish away it's that widest flat side. So once you rub it around a little bit, you'll probably be able to see that it is sharpened up a little bit and looks a little bit more shined up. And then you can just reattach it to your handle, make sure it's flat and level, put that screw back in place and give it a go. And I guarantee you will notice a difference. It's like so many things in life. You don't think it's actually dirty. Like when you're looking at a piece, you're like, I don't need to clean that dresser. But then when you clean it and you look at the water afterwards, you're like, I absolutely needed to clean that dresser. I'm so glad I did. So this is another thing. You're not going to notice the difference until after you do it and you see what the difference in the result is. But especially if you're someone that finds this work a little bit hard on the body, I recommend Doing this and other things that ensure that your tools are in top shape and in top form so they're the ones having to do much of the effort and you don't have to rely on your body and your muscles to do all of that heavy lifting on your behalf. Furniture flipping tip number three. Okay, picture this. You are sanding down a wood surface. Maybe it's a dining table. Maybe it is the top of a dresser. And you're using a random orbital sander. So those are those circular sanders that basically turn the disc so that it can eat away that finish quickly and easily. But you either, scenario A, have too low of a grit for the point you're at in removing that finish. So maybe you're at a very low grit, you're using 80 grit, maybe 100, while all the finish is already kind of removed and it just needs something higher like 150 or 200 to finish it off and close those wood grains a little bit. Or scenario B, maybe you are new to using a random orbital sander and you are holding it in place for a little too long and that is resulting in this happening, or scenario three, perhaps you're pushing down when using this random orbital sander, which PS, you do not need to do. Just let the sander do the work for you and hold it onto the surface. You don't need to be pushing hard down on it. If you're using the right sandpaper grit and the battery is charged, it will do the work for you. So it could be any one of these scenarios, but the result is you get those little swirly looking marks in the wood 
finish that you are sanding. And I say wood finish because although this can happen on laminate and other things, you're probably just painting those. But in the case that you're wanting to stain it, it's going to be either solid wood or veneer. However, if you happen to know it's a veneer, I wouldn't recommend using the random orbital sander because it's going to try and eat through that. But that's not the point of this. So you end up with those swirly marks and you're like, oh, God damn it. Now I'm going to have to paint it. No, pause. You do not. I have a fix for you. Try this first. So you're going to take some wood filler. You want it to be a stainable wood filler. And ideally you want it to be like roughly the tone of the wood that you're working with. So if it's a lighter wood or more of a golden oak or a dark mahogany, like get a wood filler that's kind of the same vibe, kind of the same color family. That is a stainable wood filler. I like to use Elmer's, works great. And you're going to take some of that and put it into a separate container and mix it with some water. And you want to mix it up until it's a liquidy consistency that you could brush over the surface. But you don't want it to be thick like a paste. You want it to be watered down closer to what you would do for a paint wash. And then you're going to brush that over the surface of the furniture piece that ended up with those marks and you want to make sure to get that into those swirl marks really well. So you don't necessarily have to go in the direction of the wood grain. Just try and make sure that everything is covered with a very light coating of this. Let it dry completely and then you're going to come back and use a high grit sandpaper. I would say anything over like 250 grit and higher because you want it to be really silky smooth and you're going to sand in the direction of the wood grain. And it's going to basically sand away the large majority of that wood filler, except for, if it worked out correctly, the wood filler that ended up in those swirls. It should have gone down into that mark and filled it in. It's not going to look perfect right now. Just trust the process. Like with any furniture makeover, you need to trust the process. So once you have that sanded down, wipe it clean, use a damp microfiber cloth, a tack cloth, or mineral spirits, whatever you like to use, and then go in and stain as you normally would, which probably should include using a pre-stain or a wood conditioner, but again, that's not what we're talking about, okay. Just can't help putting my little tips in, okay? I just want everyone to know how to do it right. So then when you go in and you stain, you, in theory, should not be seeing those swirl marks anymore. It should be masking it. It should have filled it in with that wood filler. And then when you stain it, it should have camouflaged it perfectly. I hope it works for you. You're welcome. And remember that there is always a solution for whatever situation you may find yourself in with a furniture makeover. If there is a will, there is a way, my friend. Furniture flip tip number four. So we know when we are sanding a piece, we want to start with lower grits, maybe 80, 100, 120, and work our way up to a more fine grit because that's going to smooth out the surface and open up those wood pores so they're nice and silky smooth and they're ready to accept whatever is going on them, whether it be a wood conditioner, a stain, a top coat, etc., etc. However, has there ever been a time when you have broke up your process into a couple of days? So you're like, okay, today I'm going to clean and do repairs. Tomorrow we're sanding. And then on day three, we are going to do the staining. Well, I would recommend that moving forward, you always do your final sand right before you're going in with that finish, that stain, top coat, whatever it may be. And that's because when you are sanding, you are basically opening up those wood pores so they can accept that product. And that's why it ends up looking so flawless and uniform is because those wood pores are open and they are all uniform themselves. However, if you leave it overnight, those wood pores are going to close up again. So you can get it to, you know, as close as you want it to be. But instead of doing that final sand, cleaning up all the sanding dust and then going inside for the night, leave that final sand for the following day, do the last sanding, get everything clean and get the dust out of there and then go in with your next step and you will get a much smoother, more uniform finish. Especially when you're working with trickier pieces, this could make a huge difference in your final finish. Furniture flip tip number five is a little hack if you are ever going to be painting a piece that has any glass panes in it, like a buffet unit, a china cabinet, something like that, or a mirror in it. So if it's a mirror itself, 
attached to a dresser, a vanity, that kind of thing. And if you presumably don't want to get paint onto it because you're not planning on painting that surface, you have a couple options here, a couple different hacks. First, you could just paint it normally and you know not worry about getting anything on the glass or the mirror and then let it dry fully and then go back with a razor blade and basically holding it parallel to that surface, just scrape away along the edge of frame or whatever is actually supposed to be painted and that usually will remove a good amount of the paint. Sometimes it gets a little bit tricky in getting like a perfectly straight line. If you get nitpicky, it can be a little frustrating frustrating and it's definitely tedious so that is an option but is probably not the best option to be honest it takes longer than you would think especially if you have multiple panes of glass in this piece hack number two is my personal favorite so i have a deck of playing cards that i keep in the workshop that i don't necessarily care to use as playing cards and i basically take them and slide them underneath the lip of the frame surrounding the glass or the mirror and i put those in lengthwise and just basically create a border around the openings of the perimeter and just slide them all in and then just paint as normal. So you're gonna get paint on these playing cards. Don't use any collector's items, but let it dry thoroughly. Or actually, I take that back. I would recommend pulling it out before it's fully dried because that will avoid any sort of like peeling up of the paint and then let the cards dry before you put them back into the deck, obviously, but you will have, in theory, zero paint on your glass or your mirror if you did it correctly. And it's easy peasy, super cheap. Grab a deck of cards from the dollar store if you don't have some laying around at home. And it's a great hack. But number three, there is an option because there's always a product out there for anything. You could also get some liquid mask and peel. And again, I'll link that in the show notes. But basically, it is a clear gel that you would paint a layer around the edges of the pane of glass or the mirror. It dries. You can paint as normal and don't worry about getting it onto it. And then once everything's dried, you go through and it peels like a thin rubber surface essentially off with the paint that you got on it and everything's nice and clean. And you don't need to use a ton of it too. So it will last if you go this route, but in my books, the playing cards are the way to go. But I wanted to give you options. And the sixth and final furniture flip tip for today's episode is how to approach drip marks in your painted finish. It happens to everyone. Sometimes you get a little bit too much paint on your roller, on your brush, or even when you're spraying, if the nozzle is putting too much paint onto the surface, or maybe you leave it in the same spot for a couple beats and you end up with a drip mark. While it is wet, do not go in and try and repair it if it has been sitting there for more than like a couple seconds. Like if you see it in the moment when it happens and you're using a roller or something like that, you can go back over it and try and fix it. But if it, for example, started dripping when you're on the left side of the piece, you worked your way over to the right, put the tool down and then like look back at it and notice there was a drip mark where you first started, just leave it because you'll probably do more damage than good at that point once it started to set. Let it dry thoroughly and then go back after it has dried with a razor blade or an X-Acto knife and you're going to, similar to how you would get it off of glass or off of a mirror, you're going to hold that blade parallel to the surface and just lightly essentially scrape the drip off, like cut it off kind of thing, because it's gonna be raised up a little bit higher than the rest of the surface. Cut that drip off and then get some high grit sandpaper to lightly sand the area around where that drip was, just so you know it's all flush. And then you can go ahead and lightly sand the rest of the piece because we do that in between layers of paint anyways, right? Of course, because we want it to be as buttery smooth as possible. So go in, do that sand, and then go in with your next layer of paint. And you will not even know the difference that there was a drip there previously. And something you may not know about me, I love little motivational messages. They always get me fired up, and I keep a running list of ones that are especially catchy or speak to me in the notes app on my phone. And I end every podcast episode with one that I've noted down over the years so that you can leave our time here each week feeling inspired, motivated, and ready to take on whatever comes your way this week. 
And today's Mel's motivational message is, education without application is just entertainment. That is why, my lovely little busy bees, I always recommend that you take these tips, whatever ones that speak to you, whichever ones you feel may be applicable to you, put them somewhere that you'll remember and then put them into action while you're in the workshop, while you are working on your furniture flips because that's the only way really that you're going to cement that into your brain. Of course, I want my content and this podcast to be entertaining and enjoyable just to listen to, just for shits and gigs. But at the same time, I also want you to learn a thing or two and get some new tools to put into your tool belt and ways that you can approach these makeovers. And especially when you come across these barriers or these bumps in the road that might get you feeling very down about the work that you're doing because something screwed up and so you make that into something bigger than it needs to be and you're like oh I suck at this why did I even try and you get all down in the dumps about it that's a totally normal response because you already feel uneasy about trying this thing that you don't know a lot about. But the only way that you are going to really learn these things is by doing them. So I want you to have the strategies in your back pocket that you can pull out when needed, have different things that you can try. There's no one thing that's gonna work for every single situation. So having a few things in the back of your mind, having the tools that can help you out, And the advice, I think, I like to think it's helpful knowing that I've done so many of these pieces and I still run into these issues all the time and this is how I like to approach them. That's why I like to share whatever I can on here so that hopefully it helps at least one person, if not right now, then hopefully down the road when they need it most. And if you made it to the end of this episode, if I could ask for two more seconds of your time and one small favor... If you hop over to that podcast player app that you are listening on, could you please leave this podcast a review or rating out of five stars? This is just going to help people to find the podcast in the future and let them know that it's a trusted source, that people are enjoying it and that they should tune in and listen because that's the only way that this is going to grow and we can share these furniture flip tips to the world. All right, that's it for now. And thank you so much for being here and for your time and I will catch you guys next week.